Hi, it's Gary. Welcome to today's video. Today, the topic I'm going to discuss, it's described by a small word, but it's actually a really, really big topic, and that's infinity. Infinity, it's big. It's so big, to be honest, most of us, we can't even imagine how big it is. Let's try a little experiment. Think of the biggest number you possibly can. Maybe even think about infinity. Now add one to it. Add one again. And keep adding one. And no matter what you do, you will never come close to actually reaching infinity. Even if you started with infinity. It's the, such a weird number that it's not really a number. It could even be described as a magnitude. But it's something very weird, but also very powerful. So what is infinity? Well, the quick answer. Infinity is something that's boundless, endless, or larger than any number. I know personally, I do find it confusing. You know, we often talk, we often think about as infinity as a number, and it's made to look like one in lots of equations, but it's not a number. And as I said, it may be more of a magnitude. I always assume that a number has a finite amount, you know, like 10, 1 million, 1 trillion, 764,820. They're finite numbers. Whereas infinity, it's an amount that, well, strangely enough, it's infinite. There's not a finite amount to it. Let's take a look at some history to see if that helps us with understanding infinity. The first recorded discussion about the nature of infinity was by the Greek philosopher Anaximander. Hopefully I pronounced that right. And he lived from 610 to 546 BC. And I'll be honest with you, it always gets me, and I always think it's odd when I see the way that years go when you're talking about BC, because I'm not used to seeing them going up, and to see them going down is a bit weird. He used the word aperion, and that roughly translates to unbounded or indefinite. And that's what the Greeks used to refer to infinity. The earliest appearance of infinity in mathematics was by Pythagoras. He believed that any aspect of the world could be represented just by whole numbers. But then he was surprised when he found that squares, they couldn't be represented this way. For a square of size 1, the diagonal of that is the square root of 2. And that's 1.414213562. And that keeps going on. I believe it goes on infinitely. So it doesn't meet his rule of being able to represent things using solely whole numbers. In modern mathematics, we would say that the ratio is irrational and that it's the, the limit of an endless non-repeating decimal series. Plato and Aristotle, they were both influenced by Pythagoras, but they disliked the idea of infinity. In 250 BC, Aristotle, he distinguished potential infinity from actual infinity. And he thought that actual infinity, it was impossible due to the various paradoxes that it would produce. He was, though, happy with the concept of potential infinity, which is being able to count without end. Let's jump to India. The Jain mathematical text, Suraya Prajnapti, that classified numbers into one of three sets. Innumerable numbers, innumerable numbers, and infinite. Jumping forward in time to the 16th and 17th century, European mathematicians, they started to use infinite numbers and infinite expressions in a more systematic manner. Galileo, he demonstrated that the set of counting numbers could be put in a one-on-one -on -one correspondence with the apparently smaller set of their squares. He also showed that the set of counting numbers, they can be matched to the set of their doubles or we would call them even numbers. So here we've got 1, 2, 3, 4. They could be paired with 2, 4, 6, 8. This, it's known as the Galileo paradox. In 1655, John Wallace, he was the first to use the infinity system in his publication De Sectionibus Concisis. And he was using this to aid with the calculations of areas. He did this by splitting an area into an infinitesimal strip with a width of 1 over infinity. In 1655, he published Arithmetica Infinitorum, in which he represented an infinite series 
infinite expressions and infinite fractions by writing the first few terms. Then he applied the ampersand, a C and a full stop. And that was to mean an ongoing infinite set. So for an example, we would have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, ampersand C dot. 1699, Isaac Newton. He wrote about equations containing an infinite number of terms in De Analisi per Equations Number Terminarum Infinitus. The use of infinitely small numbers, what well, that contributed to the discovery of calculus by Isaac Newton and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. At the end of the 19th century, George Cantor, he studied infinite sets and infinite numbers. He was able to show that these sets, well, they should be of different sizes. An example, if you look at a line as a set of all points, then the infinite number of these points is larger than the infinite number of integers. I know, makes my head hurt just thinking about all this. What this means is that infinity, it's a mathematical concept, and this allows it to be studied and manipulated just like any other mathematical object. This mathematical concept refines and extends on that original philosophical concept by infinitely many infinite sets. And my head, it's hurting even more. One area where infinity is used, and that's in cosmology. In 1576, Thomas Diggs published a proposal that the universe was infinite. In 1584, Giordano Bruno published On the Infinite Universe and Worlds. In this, he stated, innumerable suns exist, innumerable earths revolve around these suns in a manner similar to the way the seven planets revolve around our sun. Living beings inhabit these worlds. Cosmologists, they've long tried to discover if the universe is infinite, and this, it's still an open and an ongoing question. To aid with this, what they've done is they've split finite and infinite from boundaries. Here's a thought experiment. Imagine Earth. Now picture yourself in one spot. You start to travel in a straight line. Due to the curvature of Earth, you keep walking in a straight line and end up back where you started. This is because the Earth is a finite size, but it's got no edge. Now try and apply this to the universe. If the universe were curved, it would be possible to travel in a straight line and return to where you started. Cosmologists, they've been studying the cosmic background radiation to try and measure this curvature, if there is any, of the universe. What this has done is actually shown that the topology of the universe is flat, not curved. And this, it supports the idea of an infinite universe with no edge. It doesn't prove that the universe is infinite, but what it does is shows that it's possible. Infinity, it also extends to the multiverse hypothesis, where there are infinite universes and infinite types of universes. And that's something these comic book fans like me, something we're used to from Marvel and DC Comics, and a lot of media really, they enjoy playing around with the idea of infinite universes. I've tried to simplify a lot of the research I've done, but this one simple concept this one simple word, infinity, it's actually very, very complex. And as I've been thinking, as I've been researching, I've already said this a couple of times, really made my head hurt. I've really enjoyed researching this. I know I say this all the time, but I find this idea of infinity very, very complex, but very, very interesting because it's something that's out there, but I think there's still a lot that can be done to try and understand it. What are your thoughts about infinity? What was your knowledge? What do you know about it? What can you add to this? Please drop your comments down below. Let's kickstart the conversation. Please hit the thumbs up button. Every time you like, every time you comment, just helps with the YouTube algorithm. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel so that you can get new videos as I release them. I'll talk to you again soon.